Xenia is is fundamentally, as you as you say accurately, it's hospitality, especially hospitality to the stranger. Um, but it's the dynamic that allows for human beings to coexist. It allows for community. Uh, the fundamental principle of community, of any community, is that let's say that you have an apple orchard. And I have uh, and I have cows, and you come over one day with a basket of apples. Now, if I bop you over the head and take your apples, we are not going to be able to coexist peacefully. You will come back with 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 your kinfolk and and the apple growing kind and make war on me, and and it will just it will not work. Uh, and similarly, if you come over with a basket of apples and I say, hi, Thomas, great to see you with the apples and you bop me over the head and then steal my cows, we can't coexist. So Xenia is this relationship. It characterizes this relationship between host and guest. And it's at the basis of all, as I say, of all community, of all civilization. Right. The only way when we think about how civilization begins historically. It begins first where we're, we're nomadic hunters and gatherers, and then agriculture allows us to stay put, right? We start figuring out the stars, we start figuring out tides, we can stay put, we can farm, we don't have to move around all the time. But once we're living beside each other, we now have to come up with a principle that will allow us to coexist in peace. Because again, if you're overpowering me and taking my stuff and I'm overpower you and taking your stuff, it's perpetual war and civilization cannot grow. We're going to be spending all of our time fighting. So Xenia and, and Zeus is to a great extent in antiquity, the god of, of Xenia. It's about the relationship between the guest and the host. Because once we agree that we get along, we can build a community, right? That word community, com Munere, right? We share duties, we share gifts, right? So I'm not going to have to do everything by myself. You're not going to have to do everything by yourself. You can do what you like to do, and I can do what I like to do, and we can share gifts with each other so that you can bring me apples and apple cider, and I'll give you milk and beef, and we can coexist, and we can all have nice things, right? Um, so this idea of community in a very, very practical sense, uh, it relies on Xenia. And, and if we think about the earliest literature in the West, really it has to do a great deal with Xenia and violations thereof. So in the Iliad, right, right when the we, we, we begin in Medias Ras, but of course the war's been going on, and the war is started by what? Well, Paris Alexandros. The theft of, the theft of Helen exactly. from. Uh, yes. Yeah, Paris Alexandros has, has stolen Helen from Menelaus. And Menelaus said, you can't do that. You're my guest. And you violated this right. host and guest relationship. And you took my wife. And I'm going to go get Agamemnon, my big brother, and every Argive I can think of. And we're now going to destroy your whole world. Right? Right. Uh, and, of course, near the end, I think it's in 23, we see the resolution. We see a moment of actual Xenia, right, where uh, Hermes guides Priam to Achilles' tent, right? We start, that, that poem starts, right? Mean and I ate a wrath, uh, sing goddess uh, of the wrath of Achilles, right? Sing goddess. And that wrath of Achilles is assuaged after Hermes leads Priam through the Myrmidons in the night and Achilles makes his peace, however briefly, with Priam and the living make their peace with the dead. And we now, there's, there's this moment of, of great Xenia. It's beautiful and powerful, and it's the end of uh, meaning. It's the end of rage, wrath for, for Achilles. We see the same thing in the Odyssey, right? When we open, we're right. in Ithaca, and we have the suitors who are guests of Telemachus and... Uh, uh, ooh. I'm blanking, uh, Penelope. And instead of practicing Xenia and being respectful of their hosts, they're eating up all the food, they're using up all the supplies, they're being bad guests. 
And of course, Odysseus, when he returns, is going to start punching people out and shooting them with arrows. <laughs> and he's going to restore right. order. You can't, you can't break yeah. this bond. When you break this bond, everything falls apart. So Xenia is a responsibility, a duty of the host to be kind to the guest and of the guest to be kind to the host. Uh, it's more or less the golden rule, you know, uh, do unto others. It's, it's more or less that. Obviously, yeah. this is very important in the Old and New Testaments as well. I mean, with there's many, yes. many instances of people being rewarded for, for their good treatment of guests. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, notably the the angels that come to visit Abraham, and you know the 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 angels that come to visit Lot. Um, there's this idea yes. that you don't know who you might be welcoming, um, and this is also true of Odysseus in his disguise, um, of course. Uh, yes. Um, and so in the well, New Testament, and, and true yeah. of Christ, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, can anything good come from Bethlehem? Who's right. this? Who's this redneck from from Bethlehem? Oh, right. Uh, it's the son of God, right? Uh, yeah, same principle, right? So, uh, in your essay, you draw a connection between Xenia um, and and the work of the uh, the poet. You, you in your essay talk about the uh, the Xenia that the mind has to practice towards reality outside itself. With this concept of Xenia, I mean, the place that I like to sort of take it in terms of in terms of poetry is, you know, first epistemological. Uh, right, that I think for for most modern people, uh, at least in America, the people that I know, uh, that there is an inherited, there's an idealism. We have in our minds an ideal of how our day should go and how we want the world to go. And anything that interferes with that, we find annoying. We find noisome. Uh, we often think about other people as impediments to the realization of our private ideal. Mm -hmm. Locus classicus would be driving in traffic, right? Right. We have, ideally, I can do this drive in 20 minutes, and then there's the traffic jam, and you're sitting there, uh, you know, if I had hair, you know, you pull out there. Um, the people start, the reality starts to feel like an impediment to as I say, this realization of a private ideal, we start to think that our ideal is reality, that we are the hosts, uh, we, are, we are the ones who should run the world. And so everything that gets in the way feels inconvenient, and it's very easy to be annoyed and to be angry and to feel bitter. And the way I would extend this idea of Xenia is to remember that everyone else sitting in traffic is also a human being and is dynamic and has hopes and dreams and faults and shortcomings and is wounded. We're all wounded. We're all hurt. We're all real people. We're not just impediments in each other's, uh, to, to the realization of each other's ideals and to extend this, this humanity. And it's difficult because things like cars and, and the internet, they turn us into abstractions. It's much easier to, uh, you know, yell at someone from your car while they're in a car than it is to yell at somebody face to face. And, right. Uh, and it's because we, we, we have this abstraction. We don't remember the full humanity of other people. Uh, in fact, I would say we rarely remember our own full humanity. Speaking of traffic, if you've ever been on 95 around where I live, there's always yep. somebody going like 100 miles an hour weaving in and they don't think they can die. Right. They don't remember they're human. They can die. Other people can die. Uh, and so Xenia, in, in, in this sense, is, is largely about remembering that other people are real right. and that we ourselves are real and we're not perfect. And our ideal world, should we be able to realize it, would be horrific. Everyone sort of has, has the suspicion, you know, of being sort of Caligula, just waiting on a scepter. If I was in control, everything would go great. <laughs> And I think, no, it would go horribly. Uh, no, one, no one's personal ideal would actually be a good world. It would be a terrible world. Right. Um, so just extending the remembrance of humanity to, to others, uh, which is a version, as I say, of this, of this fundamental principle, 
I'm not going to bop you. I'm not going to overpower you. I'm not going to destroy you. Uh, I'm going to respect you. I'm going to give you the dignity of, of difference. Um, and I think that allows for civility and it allows us to check this idealism within us that would, you know, this sort of will to power that wants everything to go our way. Right. Uh, and for the poet, uh, it also, it takes the form of, yes, uh, welcoming the, the reality of other human beings and their experiences into one's mind, into one's imagination and heart. Um, but also just the world around us more generally, the, the, not the world of ideas, but also the world of the world of things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, my former teacher, Derek Walcott wrote in his, uh, Nobel Prize lecture called the uh, the Lesser Antilles. He said, "For the poet, it is always morning in the world, despite the nightmare of history." Hmm. So he's borrowing a bit from Joyce there, the nightmare yeah. of history from Ulysses. Uh, but you know, Derek grew up in Saint Lucia, which was then a colony of the United Kingdom. People there had no voting rights; they had few rights; they had just been colonized by often very vicious British people and many of the inhabitants were of African descent and had been brought there as slaves. There was a lot of reason to be bitter. Uh, and Derek was not a bitter person, not a bitter writer. Without forgetting the nightmare of history, the emphasis in that sentence and in his work is for the poet is always mourning in the world. There's all this wonder. There's all this splendor in the world. There's all this beauty. And we shouldn't forget ever about history and its complexities and its ugliness and its barbarisms and catastrophes. But we also have to remember that the world goes on and the world is beautiful and it's always bringing forth new life. And there's always rejuvenation and there's always the possibility of rejuvenation and hope and, and these things. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think we have to remember that the world is bigger than we are, you know, with our preoccupations, as I say, we can confuse the ideal world in our mind of how we want things to go or how we think things ought to be with the real world. And we can feel embittered toward the real world because it doesn't live up to our expectations. But I think you know, as T.S. Eliot said in the Four Quartets, he said, the only wisdom worth acquiring is humility. Humility is endless. I think if we can acquire that humility and appreciate the wonder of the world that exists, uh, it's a healthy counterbalance, right? We need, we need both. We don't need to forget history, but we also don't need to forget the wonders of the world, the beauty of the world. People fall in love. We're alive. How about this? There's nowhere else in the galaxy where there's anything. Single blade of grass were discovered on Mars. The world would stop. Everyone would be terrified. Look out your window and you can see, depending on where you are, hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of blades of right. grass. And we take it for granted. Right. right. But it's a miracle that life exists here and nowhere else to our knowledge is it is quite Quite simply, it's a mm. miracle, and and it's important to remember right. that. So this this senior, it, it takes take in the, with the poet's life. It, it well in general, it, it takes the form of, you know, f what you were talking about, uh, recognizing this reality and and allowing it a space in your in yourself, but also um, in the bigger picture of recognizing that you are actually the guest <laughs> in the world. As you were saying, you know, our our minds are not the measure of reality, and so our minds are not uh just host to reality even though in a sense they are greater things than the physical than the mere you know sort of material things around us um nonetheless there is a there is a transcendence that we have to and a reality that we have to accept and that we have to live within 